Welcome everyone to our Resilient Nation Partnership Network Virtual Forum Series, Alliances for Climate Action. My name is Bradley Dean, and as part of my role with FEMA, I lead our Resilient Nation Partnership Network. Many of you are familiar with the Resilient Nation Partnership Network, but for others, this is your first experience. This is a unique network of organizations and individuals united to help communities take action and become more resilient. We have three priorities that guide our efforts promoting natural hazard mitigation and climate adaptation actions, advancing equitable resilience initiatives, and expanding capacity through partnerships. In six years, the network has grown to include representation from over 600 organizations across all sectors. As of this morning, we have more than 1,650 people representing over 700 unique organizations registered for this year's virtual forum series. That number is incredible and we know it will take the efforts of the whole community to become a more resilient nation. Everyone is welcome to join the network and we're really humbled to see the turnout for this event. As a network, we continue to learn, to adapt and to evolve. Most importantly, we listen and collaborate with you, all of our partners. And that brings us to today in our Alliances for Action Partnership Forum. It is time to take a big step towards accomplishing our shared mission, mitigating the impacts of climate change. Today begins a four week deep dive into driving climate action. You will hear from a faith leader, governor, mayor, youth advocate, tribal leader, federal agencies, the arts community, a public health research researcher from Puerto Rico, the private sector, and many, many more. But the network's efforts won't stop after this forum series ends on October 27th. Throughout this series, our team will be capturing your questions, comments, resources, and more. So please take advantage of the chat function, share comments, resources, collaborative opportunities, gaps, and needs. We will continue to coordinate with our speakers and the broader network partnership to collaboratively de develop a post-event resource. Last year, this culminated in our first ever co-created resource entitled Building Alliances for Equitable Resilience. Your insights will help inform the whole community on how we can help promote climate resilience and how the Resilient Nation Partnership Network can support collaborative action. So how do we empower this network and beyond to act? It will take increased understanding, awareness, collaboration, and an unwavering commitment to partnership. The network and all of you who have joined us for this event have proven we are willing to rise to this occasion and work to unify our efforts, magnifying our impact. We are all here today because we recognize the imperative to do more on climate change. And before we begin with all events like this, there's incredible amount of effort and necessary thanks required. To start, none of this happens without you, our network partners and forum attendees. You are here because this is truly important. Your participation, your perspectives, your expertise, and your drive to build capacity and resilience across the whole community is what keeps this network thriving. We'd like to extend our gratitude to our speakers. They believe in this initiative and have volunteered their time to come together to achieve more. To NASA and FEMA leadership, without your support, this would not be possible, and we thank you. We couldn't deliver this forum without the tireless work from several motivated individuals. So from NASA, Alexander McDonald, Shana McLean, David Green, and Tyler Green, and from FEMA, Renita Hostler and Brooks Rice. Each of you were critical in bringing this forum to a reality. Uh, finally, our Resilient Nation Partnership Network team, Ashley Sullivan, Sam Tatham, Monique Turner, you are truly the engine that keeps this network thriving, growing, and exceeding expectations. That certainly is not everyone, but without the immense amounts of collaboration, this event would not be possible. I'll finish off with a very short story, and I added that this this morning. It was definitely one of those mornings where the universe was sending me a sign. The morning, this morning, when I walked into my local coffee shop, uh, if any of you have been to Trist in Washington, D.C. on 18th Street, uh, it's fantastic. The barista was wearing a NASA t-shirt. And that is when I knew today was gonna to be a really great day. 
Once again, we welcome you to the Alliances for Climate Action virtual forum series. I would now like to introduce a fantastic partner and great friend, Monica Sanders, Managing Director of Georgetown University's Environmental Justice Program. Thank you so much, Brad, and thank you to the supporters and the organizers and the Resilient Nation Partnership Network for providing me with this opportunity to speak to you this morning and to share with you. you know, as I looked at the theme, preparing for a stronger tomorrow, I reflect on the words of one of my mentors, a very wise woman, speaking on the challenges of climate change, extreme weather, social inequity, and the search for justice. It's simply, we have to do it now, and we have to do it together. So this is a perfect moment for this kind of gathering to cover some of the topics and hear from scientists and storytellers and most importantly, practitioners. And I like to start with a story of my own. One of the reasons for why I do the work that I do, which focuses significantly on vulnerable populations who are experiencing these events, is because I'm a native of New Orleans, Louisiana. My very first contact with FEMA was after Hurricane Katrina. And so I have a very clear memory in my mind of how that event played out from the moments that it happened to being in the city in the aftermath to watching the recovery and later being an advocate for recovery against an agency that was looking for its north in this space to just a few weeks ago on the anniversary of that date experiencing Hurricane Ida and having family evacuates safely to me here in Virginia. And their narrative along the way was, this was very different because as we crossed the Mississippi River Bridge on one side, we saw FEMA trucks going into the city on the other side, which speaks to a different era in disaster management and a different place in how we interact with that agency. So I stand here having been a partner and a friend, but also having had the very unique privilege of seeing the arc of change in how we meet these challenges and I'm encouraged by that arc of change, knowing what we're facing ahead of us, that if we have done it over the last 15 years, then the next 15 years bode well for all of us. As we understand the importance of stories, it's important to understand storytellers. They are the note takers of the moments that we are in. They are the historians that help us not forget where we came from. They are the keepers of our culture. So I am excited about the fact that in this event, we're having the opportunity, not just to hear from scientists and practitioners, but from storytellers. People like the Right Reverend Kathleen Chittenden Boscom of the Episcopal Church that can serve as a moral compass in these difficult times and a reminder of focusing on those who need the most, the fastest in time. People who bring together community storytelling and science, like Dr. Pablo Mendez Lazaro of Puerto Rico, another place that experiences disasters first, worse, and repeatedly, to remind us that we can bring good science to communities and empower them to advocate for their own solutions and be good partners in those solutions. It's important that this connection is made in a moment when for the first time, the Federal Emergency Management Agency is gonna be part of the National Climate Assessment. Practitioners note the impacts of climate change and severe weather before anyone else. You're the first to respond to it. You are the ones who can tell us the ground truth that should be informing the science. You are the ones who interact the most with the storytellers. Your role in making data and information useful and accessible to communities cannot be underscored more. And so I'm excited to know that this is happening and this will be addressed in today's forum and in every forum every Wednesday this October, if I have the dates correct. But most important to note is that in this time of change, we are changing the way that we interact with communities, the way that we use science, and we're changing who is doing the speaking. I stand here as one of the first people in the role that I have. And I have the unique pleasure of doing so at a moment where I get to introduce someone who is the first person of her kind in the role that she has. In a moment where we're facing billion dollar disasters and social upheaval and the understanding that a centralized narrative and multiple, a single protagonist is no longer how we do business, that there are multiple protagonists in the story of how we address one of the most challenging events of our time. We have someone who spent 21 years as a firefighter 
in the National Guard, having served her country, have received an education at some of the finest institutions in the space. Most recently as a commissioner of the New York City Emergency Management Center, which again, one of the most active, well-versed and well-respected organizations in this country. So in a moment where we need preparedness, I think it's safe to say the woman who will speak after me is prepared. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the 12th administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the first woman to hold that role, Ms. Deanne Criswell. Thank you, Monica. Let me just do a quick sound check and make sure you can hear me. All right, great. Thank you so much first for your remarks and your great story, but second also for your support and efforts um, that you continue to put forward to advance climate change, equity and resilience. It's really humbling to see this level of participation, both from our speakers and of our audience. And I am especially grateful to have the White House National Climate Advisor, Ms. Gina McCarthy, joining us later as well. Thank you to everyone for attending today, sharing in on this space, and for taking the time to discuss how we can partner to tackle climate change. Climate change is the crisis of this generation. Communities across the country are experiencing climate change firsthand. The Western United States was literally on fire. Earlier this year, smoke from fires in Oregon blotted out the New York City skyline. The wildfire risk has become such a perpetual problem. There is no longer a wildfire season. It is a year round crisis. And these extreme weather events are becoming more frequent, more severe, and are lasting longer. Sadly, this has become our new normal. Beyond record temperatures, people are also witnessing how climate change acts as a force multiplier, turning storms, floods, and fires into profound long-term cascading incidents. In fact, since June 2021, nearly one in three Americans live in a county that has been impacted by a weather disaster. According to NOAA's data, last year alone, there were $22 billion disasters. This shattered the previous annual record of 16 and is simply going to be unsustainable as we consider the future risks we might face. A recent finding in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change also reported that climate change is widespread, rapid, and intensifying, and some trends are actually now irreversible. The time is now for us to act, to act decisively to avert a climate catastrophe. Combating climate change requires us to mitigate and adapt to our future risks. We need to encourage our communities to take a system-based approach to hazard mitigation and not just an incremental approach. Many of our programs have been built around historical risk. And while it is still important, we now face an imperative. The risks in front of us are growing and they are interacting with each other and exasperating our vulnerabilities. To better plan for our future generations, we need to run modeling scenarios about what our risk could be 10 or 20 years from now to help project what they could be facing. To meet this moment, we need to invest in initiatives to break the cycles of disaster damage and reconstruction. Our actions now will directly impact the future. In the past, FEMA was criticized for insufficient action on climate change. This will not be our future. I recognize FEMA needs to take greater action on climate change and we are rising to meet that challenge. We are rising to meet this challenge by taking action and establishing our own climate identity. First, we listen. Earlier this year, we sought public comment on what role FEMA could or should have when it comes to climate change. We heard from hundreds of groups about what they want to see in their own communities. And additionally, we stood up an internal climate adaptation enterprise steering group to help guide our role in this space. We also increased our engagement with the US Global Change Research Program. And for the first time, as you mentioned, we are participating in the development of the National Climate Assessment as authors and technical contributors. Finally, we are also working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increasing the sustainability of FEMA operations by initiating a pilot program to electrify the FEMA fleet 
and installing solar panels at our training facilities. These are just a handful of the many ways we're actively working to address climate change. But action by one organization alone does not result in climate resilience. Understanding how we can best partner to help magnify these existing efforts will be essential to our mission. Over the next four weeks, the Resilient Nation Partnership Network, with support from over 30 speakers, will lead conversations on how we establish the necessary alliances to face the myriad of challenges associated with climate change. And this event is only one step. To tackle this challenge, we all need to establish foster and maintain partnerships at all levels as we work to become a force for climate adaptation. It will be our shared responsibility to take the lessons learned, the perspectives gained, and the alliances built back to the emergency management community. Then we need to empower states, localities, tribes, and territories to make climate conversation, to make climate change a core consideration in their pre and post disaster efforts. Everyone, all of us here today have a role in creating a more equitable and resilient nation. None of us can do it alone. It will require collective action across the whole community. And it's this collective action that brings us together today. It is a shared responsibility to address this crisis. We recognize some communities may be more at risk than others due to underlying social and economic conditions. Everyone is not starting off on equal footing. This means we need action from the whole community to achieve meaningful climate solutions, and we need to ensure those solutions serve the whole community equitably. I mentioned earlier establishing FEMA's climate identity. At its core, FEMA leads the coordination across government. We act as a convener and as a trusted resource to pull together the whole community when our country is facing critical challenges. Now is one of those times to be a catalyzing force working across sectors and platforms to leverage knowledge, resources, and relationships. It is the time to build partnerships to achieve collective outcomes and to improve the nation's climate resilience. Over the next four weeks, I challenge all of you to take the lessons learned from your conversations and convenings during these sessions and propel them into action. We know we can't do this without you, and we can't do this without the motivated, informed, and, and respected partners like NASA. NASA's work goes well beyond launching rockets. For decades, NASA has been a leader in climate science and applied disaster research. Without them, we could not deliver such a meaningful forum, and we are incredibly appreciative for their partnership. We at FEMA hope to build upon this foundation and establish expanded partnerships with our agencies as we work together to achieve a more resilient nation. And so with that, I would like to introduce our co-host and our fantastic partner for this Alliances for Climate Action Forum, Senator and NASA Administrator, Bill Nelson. Uh, oh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Administrator. Uh, NASA shares the belief that climate adaptation and restoring Earth's environmental balance needs to be a primary and a priority for us all. We're going to be thinking hard about how we can best use our NASA capabilities to support those efforts. In my previous life as Senator and as a fifth generation Floridian, I have experienced over my lifetime the devastation from hurricanes. And it's only going to get worse. And having seen Earth from the window of a spacecraft, I can tell you that from that vantage point, you can see how thin the atmosphere is and how special it is that there is human life on this planet. And that thin little film of the atmosphere is what sustains all of us here on Earth. We need to protect it from the impacts of climate change. 
the understanding of the cosmos is central to NASA's mission, but so is undertaking challenges and unleashing benefits here on Earth, of which we transfer a lot of those technologies to the benefit of us Earthlings. And when most Americans think of NASA, of course, they think of exploration, but the value of NASA is much broader. We always look upward and push out into the cosmos, but central to our mission is protecting this planet. Right now, last time I checked, it's the only one we have. NASA's researchers, innovators, pioneers, they're on the forefront of our research into what's happening to our climate. Our Earth observation and research supports the Biden administration's climate agenda, which outlines putting the climate crisis at the center of our country's foreign policy and our national security. President Biden has been very clear. The climate crisis requires an all hands on deck, whole of the government approach. And of course, we can't mitigate climate change unless we can measure it and understand it. And that's our expertise. So we are putting up over the next decade, NASA's new Earth System Observatory. It's going to be five major observatories. It'll expand our expertise. It will provide the world with an unprecedented understanding of the Earth's climate system, arming us with data critical to mitigating climate change and that will help us protect our communities in the face of natural disasters. This Earth observing system is gonna be five new satellites that will give us a very precise, holistic 3D view of what is happening to our climate. And working together with our government partners such as FEMA, such as NOAA, USGS, NASA builds and launches the country's more than two dozen Earth observing satellites that are up there right now. In particular, the NASA and USGS Landsat mission continues to provide researchers with nearly 50 years of global land and shore solar reflected and emitted thermal infrared measurements. That's a mouthful. And oh, by the way, we just put up Landsat 9, the most sophisticated one of these NASA astronauts that have been up there for nearly a half a century. And these measurements help us better quantify the impacts of surface warming wildfires, droughts, floods at scales where they are managing their land resources. Uh, this Landsat 9 builds on the program's unparalleled legacy and continues our commitment to provide a continuous Earth observing observation record. And that allows the global community data that the users can investigate, document, interpret all the environmental changes that are occurring. Part of the challenge now is creating more climate resilient food systems here and around the world. And with data from these NASA satellites, farmers now can use maps, images and other data which show locations that are really good are not so good for growing crops. Landsat data can provide information about where fertilizer may be needed to be adjusted, can predict the growing conditions. Over the past year and a half, we've experienced firsthand the importance of looking ahead and the importance of understanding and planning for potential disasters. 
because the reality is the poorest and most vulnerable among us are often those who pay the highest price for inaction. And the Biden-Harris administration has made advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities a top priority. Thank goodness that the president and the vice president have done that. It's such a priority. President Biden signed an executive order to do just that, and he did it on day one. This administration has also focused on advancing environmental justice, which we know is closely linked with equity. And together, we need to further develop the capacity to monitor and reduce the detrimental impacts of these huge storms like hurricanes and a lot of the floods that come as a result of climate change. And this is going to have a tremendous impact on America's underserved communities. We need to underscore that with the clear effects of climate change. The devastation from hurricanes and floods is severe and it's growing more severe with each year. And who gets it the worst? It's often the underserved communities. And in the face of the disasters, there are significant equity issues that are going to continue to go unless we get out and get support to start changing this climate change. One of the top three priorities for FEMA going forward is through their strategic plan is climate adaptation. That's great news. We need more. We need continued agency cooperation, and I'm grateful for what we're doing, and I'm grateful for the combined cooperation in this meeting today. And what we need is a mission control center for climate change. NASA uses a mission control center for every launch and every mission. And for example, in the case of the International Space Station, it's operated 24-7, 365 over the last two and a half decades. Mission control, you've heard that term. Well, no less effort should be made to reverse the heating of our planet to allow us to restore Mother Nature's environmental balance. And NASA is where a lot of the world's expertise in climate science is and is engaged in a broad range of activities to track and mitigate the effects of the climate change. And we are actively focused on making that data available and useful for U.S. citizens and beyond. And so today I want to announce that in addition to our existing earth science programs, we are exploring a new concept at NASA, a climate resilience design center, a mission control center that can help state, local, tribal, territorial governments, as well as our fellow federal agencies, develop their climate resilience strategies. This is not something that we can do alone. It's an endeavor that is going to take collaboration with all these agencies that we've talked about today. And it's going to take data from commercial companies and from our international partners. But as one of the lead U.S. climate science agencies, NASA will take a leading role in helping our nation, the world, to prepare for the challenges to come. And they're coming fast and furious. Just yesterday, a Nobel Prize was given to a Princeton professor 
because he's the one that came up with the result that if you double the Earth's carbon dioxide in the upper atmosphere, it will result in a two degree Celsius increase in heating at the Earth's surface. That's getting very close to the point of no return. We've got to have a successful result that will lessen the harmful and unequal effects on our Earth, our home, this planet, and especially on our disadvantaged communities. And we need to provide some measure, a lot of environmental justice. It's gonna take all of us. We need to stop climate change, but we also need to ensure that the most vulnerable communities to climate change have the tools they need. And the sad reality is that climate change is already impacting our earth and especially those communities. The cost is enormous. Cost is loss of life. It's a loss of livelihoods. It's a loss of communities and neighborhoods. And unless we act, and we must act decisively. The poorest among us will suffer disproportionately and instability, not only here at home, but around the world will increase in populations. And so on behalf of the NASA family, we're gonna continue working closely with our FEMA partners and other agencies. It's important. Our decisions will determine the fate of planet Earth. So let's protect it. Let's act quite boldly and let's act with urgency. Let's preserve it for not only us, but for the generations that follow. Thank you so much, Madam Administrator, for letting me share this this morning. I would like to thank Monica Sanders, Administrator Chris Well, and Administrator Senator Bill Nelson for your insightful remarks and your support of the Resilient Nation Partnership Network. At this time, we're going to take a short five minute break to set up our panel discussion. We will begin promptly at 1241. Thank you.
by introducing our panelists as we explore our present and future vision of climate action. Co Barrett, Senior Advisor for Climate, NOAA Research, and Vice Chair, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway, Mayor of Madison, Wisconsin. Jay Co, Co Founder and Managing Director of the Lightsmith Group. Dr. Gavin Schmidt, Senior Advisor on Climate with NASA. And now I would like to turn it over to our moderator for this discussion, Samantha Medlock, Senior Counsel, Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, the US House of Representatives. Thank you all for joining us today. And I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Great, thank you very much, Brad. And I'm excited to join this panel and moderate our discussion this afternoon. We're off to a fantastic start with really inspiring remarks from Administrator Criswell, uh, from Senator Nelson, um, that really, I think, tease up the topics for our discussion this afternoon with this extraordinary panel. So I suggest that we jump right in and get right to it. We've got a really rich diversity of perspectives here. Um, and so I think it's gonna be uh, a terrific discussion. Um, as you're aware, the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis issued um, our report to Congress um, last year on uh, ways that the federal government can be confronting the climate crisis. We broke this down into um, uh, broad buckets of policy action uh, that really is centered on the foundation of strong science. Um, so I think that's an important place to start. Um, given the dire predictions uh, about the climate crisis, um, how do we motivate individuals to take action? Um, I think that's an important place for us to begin. So I'd love to uh, welcome Co Barrett and get us started there. Um, so much of our policy decisions and actions at every level of government, as well as the choices that consumers and families and businesses make um, really start from a strong foundation of climate information. Um, so given the dire situation that we are in, how do we motivate individuals and communities to take action? Over to you, Ko. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. You know, it's funny, I've given a lot of thought to this lately, um, as I've given interviews and briefings on the most recent IPCC report on climate change, but I'm not sure I've hit on the answer, honestly. I'll just think out loud maybe here. Um, you know, as science communicators, we're encouraged not to focus on the doom and gloom aspects of climate change. Um, despair is not a motivator and feeling overwhelmed can kind of freeze people into inactions to throw up their hands and say, geez, what's the use? Um, yet the report that the IPCC released in August, you know, I mean, honestly, it's hard not to dwell on the challenges because it's clearer than ever that humans are responsible for the vast majority of the warming that we're experiencing and the window to act is um, dwindling. So, um, so frankly, I'm finding it disingenuous to only focus on the sliver of hope aspect of communicating the science. And when really inside, I feel it's important to acknowledge the dire nature of the situation we're in um, but it's a tricky balance, right? Um, so <laughs> for now, I guess I'm taking the approach that it's important to communicate the urgency that the science has illuminated, that 1.5 degrees C or two degrees C above a pre-industrial baseline is not some distant nebulous temperature target to stay below, but it's right around the corner. Success in checking climate change is influenced by the choices we make today, right now. So I kind of feel like we don't have the luxury to wait and everyone has to do their part in their own lives, whether it's how we choose to um, move ourselves to our transportation, our diets, um, how we reduce our waste, how we power our lives. Um, and I believe that information is power, but action breeds hope. So action, I guess, is the antidote I'm hitting on to despair, no matter how small that action is. However small that first step is a necessary step to everything that follows. Um, so maybe the last thing I'll say on this is that I believe that community level action is particularly ripe for beating despair with hope. 
because it's possible to focus on tangible priorities in service to a collective vision for a prosperous and resilient community that is greater than ourselves, to ally ourselves with a bigger, um, with a kind of a higher um, order vision, to buoy us over those feelings that we might sometimes have of gloom about the situation we're in. And communities, cities and towns, counties, these are all places where we can assert our influence and push for transformational change, transformational action, remembering to bring the most vulnerable and underserved along with us. So um, I see this every day working with um, the folks in NOAA who have these boots on the ground activities all across the country who are doing this every day, working with communities, bringing our knowledge uh, to bear in solving actual problems on the ground. And I take hope in that. I think it's a very good start. I appreciate that. And uh, you're, you're, you're quite right. I think that if we focus just on the, um, the, the diarist of the projections or only on painting an optimistic picture of where we are and our future, we're really missing the urgency of the moment. But I think we're also missing the opportunities that we are presented with as more and more of this information is coming online, more of this information is available at planning scale and to be able to inform decision making. So we're going from uh, an uncertainty toward greater and greater certainty, demystifying a lot of this information so that it's what we would consider to be actionable. And um, I, I love, I also very much appreciate the notion of, of really looking at the needs of our state, local governments, tribes and territories. And I'm absolutely delighted to see Mayor Rhodes Conway again, who provided extraordinarily valuable testimony to the select committee recently. So uh, please stay tuned. Um, we're gonna uh, hear from, from you in just a moment, Mayor Rhodes Conway. But first I'd like to turn to Dr. Schmidt and, and Gavin, hear are your views on the sort of state of the science and that journey toward actionable planning scale climate risk information. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, we are uh, at NASA uh, very, very keen on making sure that the data that we're collecting from, from satellites, uh, the model projections that we're uh, uh, both producing and, and curating from around the world um, are being used for, for, for practical benefits. And so one of the, the key things is to really focus on that data delivery. It, it does nobody any good uh, to have data sitting in obscure formats on multiple websites where nobody is actually uh, looking for it or, or can find it. Um, and so we're using uh, the opportunities that we have for putting things into the cloud uh, to integrate the data streams that we have that come from many, many different missions, uh, from many, many different model sources, from many different kind of ways of putting that together um, so that it's then kind of there available for, for our own um, designers to make the portals uh, to talk to specific groups of people um, I'll give you. I'll give you one example. Um, uh, we just rolled out. Uh, the uh, the sea level uh, data and predictions that, that came from the IPCC report that Co was involved in. Uh, that's now all available on the NASA sea level portal. It's point and click. You can go uh, wherever you are and see what the projections are under different scenarios and see what the different uh, elements of those predictions are. The, the, the local subsidence, the regional sea level rise, the global sea level rise. Uh, and we're helping, uh, hopefully, uh, trying to get people to use this data uh, we're working on uh, similar things for uh, matching up the socioeconomic data with the geophysical data through processes, uh, through, through efforts uh, like uh, our, our socioeconomic uh, data center, where we're trying very, very hard to take the data to where people are, as opposed to just having the data there and having them come and find it. Uh, and that kind of, that last mile, so to speak, in the data delivery part is something that NASA um, is, is very conscious of um, and is working uh, uh, tremendously hard to kind of close the gap. Outstanding. And I think that's exactly what we are hearing from local leaders is, is the need for that downscale data and information, the need for technical assistance to be informing uh, the, the decision making on the ground and to look at the array of data and information and policy options. 
Um, Mayor Rhodes Conway, it's such a pleasure again to see you. We really welcome your perspective here. It is so important, I think, as we have these conversations sort of here in Washington, uh, that, that we really look to our local leaders as the co-implementers of federal policy uh, that really should be designed around the needs of, of those decisions that you all are making day in and day out. Um, so uh, we, we welcome your views on what you're hearing so far, but also what do you most need from the federal government in terms of achieving the goals that you all are setting for yourselves there in Madison, Wisconsin? Well, thank you, Sam, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's I, I feel um, slightly under-degreed to be on this panel, but... Um, uh, I, I do think it's very important for us to recognize the role of local government in combating climate change. I mean, cities have been uh, leading uh, for, you know, the past decade, really, I think, uh, and we will we need to continue to do so. Part of the importance of working at the local level, I think, speaks to the, the first question you had for Co, which is we need to localize and make personal some of the impacts of climate in order for people to be motivated to work on it, right? And so here in Madison, you know, I think there's a number of angles that we take. One is, you know, Madison experienced several years ago very serious flooding. And we're doing now a lot of work to build up our resilience to flooding and connecting that directly back to the changing climate, right? Another is the impact of heat islands in our city. Uh, but a third is the impact on the economy of some of the proactive action that we're taking against climate change. We have a fantastic program here called Green Power, where we train people to install solar panels on the roofs of city owned buildings. And then they can go on into our public works department and get a good uh, family supporting jobs. So there's lots of places where we can connect into people's lives um, and make a difference on climate change at the same time. But in terms of what cities need from the federal government, of course we need good data. And yes, we need that good data to be localized, but we also need feedback loops, right? We need to know if the action that we're taking are making a difference and if they're making a difference fast enough, right? So evaluation help uh, on policies and programs would be incredibly valuable, I think, for local governments to better target our efforts and our activities. It may also be blindingly obvious, but we need funding. Um, I'm very hopeful that um, the president's Build Back Better agenda will pass and will include significant efforts around climate uh, and that, that some of that will be directed directly to local governments uh, for us to work on the issues in the way that are most relevant um, at the local level. That's That varies across the country and across cities. So it's very important, I think, to get the resources to the local level where we can make the best use of them. Um, you know, I think also uh, help in looking at not just current conditions, but future risk um, is important. Um, you know, for example, I don't, not to pick on anybody here, but uh, we are conducting a citywide watershed study, watershed by watershed, to look at future flooding risk, because we know that the current maps we have are not, A, not accurate for what we're experiencing today, and B, not predictive of uh, on the scale on which we build our infrastructure, right? We build infrastructure for 50 to 100 years, right? We need to know how to size that infrastructure and what the right balance between green, green and gray infrastructure is for that next 50 to 100 years. And the, the information we have right now is insufficient to do that. So that's a lot, but I really think there's an important partnership between local governments and federal and state governments and that does have to do with with data, but but really practically the application of that data and the resources to support that application. Well said. Um, and you know, we we hear this from local leaders across the nation, uh, whether it's coastal or inland, folks dealing with flood or wildfire or drought or extreme heat. Um, the the various ways that the climate crisis is is creating instability on the ground. Um, and, uh, and what we really hear resoundingly is the need for federal policy to be geared toward those local needs in ways that are adaptable um, and recognize the differences across those landscapes and deploy policy where people are. 
Um, we, we also, I think, are struck as we work with local leaders at the integrated way that policy is pursued at the local government level. Um, and so I'm really grateful that you mentioned renewable energy and solar panels um, and, and the ways that, uh, that these kinds of investments not only can increase resilience and help communities and families and businesses adapt, um, but also decarbonize and create great jobs. Um, and so there's these triple and quadruple bottom lines that are available in ways that federal policy doesn't always recognize. Um, so a couple of examples that I'll mention before I turn it over to Jay, uh, because I, I know full well the financial services sector and investors get what I'm about to say, um, which is that it is, it is not a, uh, a pursuit of reducing emissions in, in one sphere and increasing resilience and helping adapt in another sphere is pursued in a much more integrated way. Um, for example, as we rebuild communities that have been damaged by storms or other events, can we also help them reduce uh, building emissions? Um, as we seek to advance the kinds of retrofits to the built environment to reduce carbon footprint, are there opportunities to also bring along resilience and help adapt? Um, so I think we're, we're ripe for this kind of comprehensive climate policy agenda. And we do see that embedded in the Build Back Better agenda. We see that embedded in the four, the four corners of, uh, of the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, as well as the Build Back Better Act and reconciliation. Uh, but, but Jay, you're steeped in this and you very much have the, uh, your finger on the pulse of, of what investors are thinking and the ways that these issues are digested in, in, uh, in the markets. So we'd love your views. Thanks so much, Sam. It's great to be here. I also feel uh, under, under, under degreed, I guess, in, in this context. But it's also, as a kid from Chicago, it's great to see somebody else from the Midwest um, here as well. Um, I think that there are three things that are happening in the private sector that, that touch on these kinds of issues. One, of course, is the issue of data and understanding really how to digest that, right? So it's one thing to have IPCC explain the incredibly scary code red scenario that we're in, which is a 1.53 baseline now which means everything else gets worse from here. And we're on a trajectory that's well away from that, even if we got 100% of Paris done or whatever is gonna come out of Glasgow. And so that reality is one where the Marshall Islands probably doesn't exist. It's one where at 1.1, 1.2 degrees, we've had tragic deaths uh, here in New York and New Jersey area. Um, and it's a humanitarian disaster and a real wake up call. I think that some of the younger generation have heard in, in a much clearer way than other folks have as well. But that, that sound and alert, I think is also being heard very clearly now in the investor sector, which looks at uh, increasing amounts of focus on climate risk and the data that's needed to be digestible by the private sector to inform that set of risk decisions. And so pushes for, I think, more uniform disclosure among investors, among companies uh, uh, on, a, on a kind of globally harmonized basis are accelerating. I think they're critical to really understand how to make capital flow in a way that actually makes sense and to inform some of the exact kinds of decisions, whether it's what kind of municipal bonds we wanna buy to support the growth of cities uh, or what kind of risk we see in our utility sector or our, in our water sector or in coastal real estate and so on. And I think you're seeing an acceleration in that interest and demand uh, in the private sector for that kind of data. That's the first thing. The second is really that we are in the middle of this unbelievable global pandemic and nothing is stopping climate change. So there's a double whammy effect that's occurring right now where the people that are most vulnerable to respiratory ailment because of environmental issues and equity issues, environmental exposure, are also being impacted by COVID and then being impacted by wildfire smoke uh, or by uh, other sets of issues that are being accelerated or exacerbated by uh, the climate change phenomenon. So this is a problem of equity and justice that's integrated into this challenge. The third point is that there is a double upside story here too. We can build for the world that we're going to see, which has necessarily going to be a low carbon future, but one that absolutely has to be resilient to climate change, or we will risk all the investment and effort that we're putting in being destroyed or devastated over the next you know, couple of decades going forward. And that's the opportunity that we have. By no means do I wanna take away from all of this conversation, the urgency and the crisis that we're in and the humanitarian impact that we're seeing out there, but there is also a dramatic and increasing opportunity for technology and investment to be directed at transitioning our energy sector, our economy to a low carbon future, and one that specifically takes into account 
resiliency and adaptation to the future set of conditions that we will all live in and our children will live in and their grandchildren will live in. And if we do that correctly and align government policy, whether it's standards, disclosure, regulation, and capital, um, then innovation technology can help us to build a better future than just trying to fend off 10 or 20% of the damage that we're absolutely now going to see if you believe the IPCC projections at this point. So my message to you would be, there is a, a real kind of opportunity as well as the risk that's being seen now by investors that has to be unlocked in partnership with multiple stakeholders and certainly is going to be um, uh, manifested at the local and subnational level as well. Indeed. To that, I, I would add, based on discussions with investors over the years, there is there is tremendous amounts of capital available um, and it is going into uh, strong climate initiatives in other parts of the world um, and not coming on shore in the United States quite as much yet, but there is great opportunity there. Um, and uh, I, I think also that there needs to be um, this, this translation of information into policy in, in ways that is, that is sort of cognizable under the law. Um, and, and that I think is, is a bit of a challenge, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, corporate counsel who are advising their, uh, their uh, uh, boards and their executive committees about disclosures, or even the design of federal policy around things like benefit cost analysis. So, uh, so how, and, and I'm going to start uh, uh, with Co. Barrett, how do you think that we go about um, embedding into climate policy at the federal level, but I think this is relevant for, for states and local governments and tribes and territories too, um, the, the kinds of thresholds or triggers um, or the kinds of break points so that we can distinguish between an investment that is going to drive a just and resilient outcome from one that is not going to do that. I, I think that from the, the corporate perspective, from investors' perspectives, uh, they are also looking for these kinds of bright lines to the extent that they're available. Uh, and so where do we distill this technical climate science into actionable information who, for folks who don't do this every day, um, but also for purposes of evaluating projects and policies? It's a tough question, yeah. but I, that's why it's I'm starting with you. But I love that we're having it, this conversation because, you know, I mean, I think if you look across the federal agencies, we have a lot of the data that would help to answer that question. I mean, we at NOAA, we can look at um, historical data to see when we've exceeded certain thresholds for climate variables that may be, you know, important to the financial sector, to municipalities. Um, but I, I think as Mayor Rhodes Conway said, um, it's not enough to just have that data and hand it over, that these feedback loops are really important. And I would stress that the feedback loops are important to us as well, the providers of this data, because we need to we need to make it available in ways that are useful, immediately practical to the folks who are on the ground who are trying to solve their problems based on their priorities. So it really is an iterative process. I mean, I personally think it's important to do what we can to democratize access to data, right? We need to get that data out there. Gavin was talking about this in his earlier comment. Like, let's make it available. Let's make it available to so many people out there that we can tap into innovative perspectives and bring diversity to solve this complex problem. Uh, but we have to be having those conversations so that we can constantly improve and respond to the priorities that people have identified for their cities or their, their communities. And, and, you know, in that regard, let's just be honest, the federal government can do a lot to come to the table with information. But honestly, I feel like we are at a point in this country where we have 30,000 communities that we need an army of climate practitioners. I don't know if that's the Climate Conservation Corps or, or whatever it is, teaching the next generation of folks to actually work in our communities 
to be translators of information. But, you know, we really do need just a whole cadre of folks who are on the front lines working this information. Could not agree more. And to your point about uh, about the, the Climate Corps, um, you know, the opportunity, I think, also to bring in young people uh, and folks that are earlier in their careers to look at this through the lens of, of K-12 curriculum and higher education and, and the trades is such an important point and, and what that Civilian Climate Corps is, is really intended, I think, to, to tap. Um, I, I also want to give the, the full panel the opportunity to, to weigh in. So, so please feel free to unmute and, and jump in anytime. This is a free flowing discussion. Um, and, I, and so I, I think you've, you've hit on so many points there, Co, that, uh, that, are really, um, that are really relevant. And I'd like to stick with this theme of feedback loops because I think it's a fundamental challenge in federal policy to, uh, to deploy information or to deploy capital and investment and funding um, and be able to track that and, uh, and, and see how, what is the effect on the ground so that in the next grant cycle or in the next uh, tranche of funding that gets released, that it's actually informed by the changes that we are seeing and, um, and the, the information is also continuing to evolve to keep up with what each event has to teach us. Um, it also strikes me, and, and then I'm gonna uh, get, get Mayor Rhodes Conway's views on this, the, the ways that basic information is fed into things like building codes and standards, um, zoning decisions, comprehensive planning and capital improvement planning is, is, a, is a long uh, tail in, in a lot of respects. And the, uh, the uh, turnover of building stock, the turnover of infrastructure can also be a very long journey. Um, and, and so uh, Mayor Rhodes Conway, I'd, I'd love your, uh, your lens on this, both through your role as, as mayor for your community, but also as a leader for climate mayors, you're also in touch with mayors across the nation. Um, and I don't know that it's really well understood in Washington, what the day-to-day -day functions of local government are and, and how federal policy touches that through, uh, again, your, your zoning, your codes decisions, your review of permits. But I'd love for you to, to talk a little bit about that and what it means in the day-to-day -day operations of a community uh, through, through your experience. Yeah, thanks. There's there's so much there. Um, I, I, just a couple of thoughts. So firstly, uh, on the idea of feedback loops, I think it's really important that we think about feedback loops being part of the hope generation and the motivation for action as well, right? So if we can show people that planting trees has lowered the temperature at ground level by, you know, however much, right? That's a feedback loop that will inspire people to do more, right? So there's, I think that there, that's a, a critical piece in the motivation. Um, but to your question, um, you know, it, the way that I like to think about it is that um, cities have a DNA, right? And that's our building codes. Um, it's the standards by which uh, we design and build infrastructure, whether that's streets or sewer pipes or transit systems or, you know, whatever it might be, right? But all of that has, there's a DNA behind that, right? And what we need to do is we need to embed into that DNA that how we make the decisions, how we design infrastructure, the awareness of and the knowledge about climate. Right. And and again, not what our climate is like today, but what it is going to be like in 10, 20, 50, 100 years. Right. So that when when we're building stormwater infrastructure, we're building it for 100 years. Right. When we're building streets, we're building them for 20 to 50 years. Right. When we're building buildings, we're building them for 50 to 100 years. Right. And so we need to it's it's not enough to when a project you know, works its way through at the end point to say, oh, no, 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 this needs to be way more sustainable, right? We need to put some solar panels on it, <laughs> right? No, we need to have thought about that building from the get-go, 
right? How do we get it off natural gas, right? How do we make it super efficient? How do we make it net zero carbon? How do we make it uh, you know, as efficient on water and stormwater as we possibly can so from the very beginning, right? So that it's not after the fact that we're building these things. And that's that happens at the local level, right? For the most part, those infrastructure design decisions are being made at the local level. Now, I do want to bring up one complicating factor, which is preemption, right? So for example, here in Madison, um, we do not have control over our building codes. Right. The state has that control. And and as a result, we are held back. Right. Because the state of Wisconsin has not adopted the most up to date building codes. And I in the city of Madison cannot do that for myself. Right. I cannot make sure that the buildings that are built in Madison are state of the art because the state is holding us back. And that has a really big impact. Right. It also has a, an oddly confounding impact because, for example, there are um, programs at the federal level. The BRIC program comes to mind where you actually um, get a benefit for having the most up to date building codes. Well, that means that every municipality in Wisconsin is going to miss out. Right. Because our state is holding us back. So that's another place where I feel like really engaging directly at the local level is important. Um, but it, we should be making it possible for cities to do everything we can to change that DNA, to incorporate the awareness of climate change. And I think data is part of that. I think technical assistance is part of that. And honestly, I think that political will is part of that. And, and that's something that does need to be mustered uh, at the local level, but can be reinforced uh, from the state and federal levels as well. I'm really glad you brought up I, that subject. Please no, go I, ahead. I, I, just, I just wanted to jump in for a second because I, I think this this um, issue of standards is something that we in the federal government really need to pay attention to. We're we're starting at NOAA. We have a partnership with the America the Civil Engineer Society uh, to start to like make sure, just as the mayor is saying, we have good information about future projections in order to change standards. And I think this also is really pertinent to Jay's um, earlier comments, because um, it's not clear that climate scientists deliver climate information that is in the form that's most useful to the financial asset sector. You know, they need information on timescales that maybe it's not decadal, it's, it's not centennial, centennial. It can be, you know, on a time scale where we need to adapt to be able to provide um, those folks the information they need to manage their assets. And we need to do it in a way that's authoritative so that there's not just someone who's feeding the wrong information that's really not useful and underpinning these massive financial decisions with the wrong information. I wanted just to highlight on what Co was just saying here and, and uh, the mayor as well, that that's absolutely right. Um, your average investor, a personal investor has, you know, can read the headlines and the executive summary, maybe of the IPCC, but it's very difficult to translate in, that into what should I pay for my mortgage this year? Or do I think I'm going to have insurance the year after next? Right. And, and those decisions are, you know, made in an environment where you sort of assume that past performance projects future performance until it doesn't, until you can't get insurance, until your home values drop, until your 401k disappears because you picked the wrong municipal bond fund to invest in that you thought was very safe. That's what those are supposed to be for. And so what I would say is um, part of the translation issue here is that the, the, the single metric in the private sector for risk is credit risk. Everything gets boiled into credit risk, uh, the risk of you know, political insurrection, the risk of devaluation, the risk of fire, flood, storm, demonstrations, anything, strikes, um, trade interruption, it all gets boiled down into credit risk. And embedded in credit risk analysis is an assumption that the future looks something like the past. And that is becoming an increasingly incorrect assumption. There's environmental assumptions baked into all the analysis we're doing. And so a lot of what happens today is we're driving by looking in the rearview mirror. And we need to start looking forward because there's a directionality to how that's going to go. And unfortunately, we're going to make it increasingly complex to the point about feedback loops going forward. Adaptation to climate change is going to be a forever problem. And the scale of it and the scope of it and the shape of it is going to continuously change. I just look here at the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy 
And then a lot of the, the kind of um, uh, attempts to kind of uh, waterproof parts of the New York City subway against with the, with the projected storm surge, sea level rise sets of issues to flood different subway stations were in Ida was completely different. It was massive inundation from the sky. So a totally different set of subway stations were the ones that got completely impacted. And as a financial investor who might buy municipal bonds or be the counterparty to the parametric insurance that was sold in the aftermath of Sandy, you're gonna really be confused about what happened there. So taking that translation from the science that can actually do the after action analysis and translate it on a dynamic basis going forward, because we're gonna keep surprising ourselves here, um, into something I can digest and understand as an investor, that means translating that into credit risk. So the one thing I would add into this whole argument is we need to avoid the Esperanto problem. What we can't have is inventing a totally new language that nobody else wants to speak ever. We have a language of risk today. We have building standards that need to be updated. We have assumptions about floodplains that need to be updated and continuously updated. We have assumptions about fire risk, about uh, business interruption risk. We have assumptions about the supply chain, about agricultural productivity and water scarcity. All those need to be updated and in a way that can actually feed into the way we think about risk today. And simplistically for investors, that means credit risk. And then the flip side to that is what is the opportunity? There will be new technologies we're going to need, new ways of routing, shipping, and packaging if there's going to be more fire and flood and interruption. And the people who can figure those things out and design the products that we're going to need in the future, the services that we're going to want, the kind of food that we can sustainably grow, and the water supplies that we need, and the kind of places we want to live that will be resilient to this future and a better set of outcomes, those are the people that will drive the economy in the future going forward. That's where the jobs will be created going forward. So I would urge the simplistic translation of science back into uh, things that the private sector can understand. We're looking for that. And also a, a reframing a little bit, not just of this as this is a crisis, make, make no mistake, but it's also an opportunity and it must be an opportunity and framed that way, or we'll never mobilize the capital required. And we're going to live in a, a future that's going to be increasingly grim. Can I add in uh, a couple of points there, uh, uh, really focusing in on, on what the mayor said and what, and what you just said, Jay. Um, it, it's not sufficient for uh, the, the science and the, and the data providers just to provide like, you know, like here is some data. Uh, what we need to do, because the science is changing, it's being updated. You know, the stuff that was state of the art 10 years ago that people used, uh, you know, perhaps uh, associated with the National Climate Assessment uh, version three, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not quite obsolete, but, but it's, you know, it, it's evolving. And so, and so what we need to do is we need to co-produce, and that was, that was Ko's point, uh, we need to co-produce uh, not just uh, data delivery or or, um, uh, or or technical expertise. We need to we need to co-produce a sustainable way of dealing with sustainability. Uh, we need to build this kind of data delivery from the observations, from the models, uh, from the scientists into your processes, uh, but in in a continuous way, so that when things get updated upstream, that is immediately available to people downstream. You don't have to start all over again with oh well, there's a new set of projections there's a new set of things and we have to begin all over again if we if we do that then every time we start that we're just starting from scratch again we have to build in systems that allow that pipeline of information to be adapted to be uh, to be edited to be updated um uh, and and you know and iteratively uh in order to uh, to make this as 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 functional and as uh, uh and, and as of greater practical benefit as possible and I would argue that we also need um, perhaps a lot more applied research in this area because I just think about um, like, I'm sorry, but we're going to keep having roads. So I pavement technologies that can cope with higher temperatures, but also with more severe freeze thaw cycles, right? I mean, just one example in which like I literally have no idea what's out there. I don't have the time to figure it out. Nobody on my staff has the time to figure this out or invent this, right? But somebody out there does, right? And every city in the country needs it, right? So, and then amplify that across every piece of infrastructure, right? So, so yes, we need that data. Yes, we need that pure science, but we also need to figure out how we apply it into the everyday pieces of our lives. Um, and cities can't do that on their own.
right? And so we do desperately need help from the federal government, from the private sector um, to invent these new solutions uh, and deliver them to us in a way. The other thing that I want to just point out is that, um, you know, it's it, we hear a lot about the biggest cities and, and how ambitious they're being around climate, which is wonderful. We need those cities to lead. Um, but, you know, with my, my hat on as co-chair of climate mayors, there's a lot of little cities out there. Right, that that do not have enough staff uh, to deal with this, that do not have the capacity or the funding to deal with this, and so, um, you know, you present them with, you need to work on climate change, and <laughs> like, okay, but, right, so we we also need to be presenting it into here's how you think about it in your infrastructure. Here's how you think about it in your finance. Here's how you think about it in your community services. Here's you know so that it's that we're translating that into what municipal governments already do and showing them a path forward that is uh, proactive on climate while also meeting the needs uh, you know, of each local government and the things that they have to work on to serve their communities. You know, one, one thing I wanna just hit on here is, and this is not the answer to everything, but you know, we do, the US government has something called the Climate Resilience Toolkit. It draws on the input from many federal agencies. NOAA happens to host it, but it's not a NOAA product. It has designated steps that you would go through to build resilience. Every place doesn't have to go through every, every step. But to your point, Mayor, um, you know, cities and, and towns can identify their top five priorities, their top three priorities. Um, maybe yours is the, you know, asphalt technology. Um, but I, but the point is that the steps are pretty similar, whether you're a big city or a small town, but it really depends what are the priorities. And then once you've narrowed that down for, you know, okay, we're going to focus on these three, then we can get data. Then we can have the conversations. How do we, how do you consult within your constituency uh, about, about bringing these changes to bear? How do we adapt it? Because we're not, not every place is the same. So I feel like it's kind of a combination, like we've all been talking about this whole panel of what's kind of some basic information tools we can have um, that we share, and then how do we tailor that to specific situations to really achieve resilience? So here's a crazy idea, and maybe it's the climate core, right? But what we really need, it sounds to me like, is we really need uh, community extension workers on climate. Right. You think about, I mean, I, you know, here I am in Wisconsin, right? We have extension workers on all sorts of things related to agriculture, right? Um, and other things as well. But that's a really powerful model um, that helps a lot of places. And so, what if we had that? What if NOAA had that, right? But focused on climate and resilience. I'm so glad you mentioned the extension model because it is wildly successful. Um, it's very familiar. It is deployed across the United States in ways that are tailored to the local landscape. Um, the, the, it has tremendous credibility and um, really great traction in communities of all sizes. Um, and, uh, and so I do think it's something that we are thinking about here in Congress. What is the relationship um, of that to something like uh, a civilian climate core? Um, and how do we take that ag extension service, that, that extension model, and, uh, and leverage that toward the deployment of sustained and multidisciplinary technical assistance that is not a site visit or a Zoom visit uh, that results in a binder of ideas that's gonna sit on a shelf, but, but actually can take a community from where they are now uh, to assessing their risk in ways that have uh, that are informed by the design of risk assessment that isn't just looking at current risk but future risk as well and opportunity assessment um, and uh, and evaluating everything from the kinds of spatial planning or land use planning, where a community is today and what that community's vision is and that locally led uh, trajectory into the future, um, but also to really get at some of the 
hard realities that some of our communities, too many of our communities are facing um, where there are landscapes that they may not be able to continue to occupy into the future. And what does that transition look like from where they are now of, of relative risk into resilience? And then finally, in terms of technical assistance, it shouldn't end there, but it really should be a way of supporting communities engaging in going after the kind of funding, the kind of financing and investment. Um, for example, for many communities, how, how might they come together in a regional approach around a shared asset like a river or a watershed and, and go to the capital markets for investment? to combine in a blended finance kind of an approach in ways that investors will recognize as promising. Um, uh, it's that type of, of really robust, multidisciplinary, sustained, skilled technical assistance uh, that I, I think the extension model uh, can be expanded on to deploy. Uh, the, the other thing I wanna be sure that we have the opportunity to really look at that I think is also relevant to this conversation about technical assistance and assessment um, is the notion of justice and equity. Um, what are the types of uh, tools and resources and techniques that are already working well and can be scaled up in order to engage all communities, all stakeholders, and make sure that folks who are facing disproportionate impacts facing chronic disinvestment and racist policies that may go back a generation or more uh, can, can be at the table and um, have traction and, um, and have perspectives that are being heard and are being embedded in design. Um, I'm gonna open that up to the entire group because I know that we all have um, you know, really passionate views on this issue and it has come into the fore uh, certainly for the current administration, as well as this Congress. It's something we are taking very seriously indeed. And of course, we, we also see FEMA and, and other federal partners doubling down on this and really wanting to take a very thoughtful approach to this issue. Why don't I say one thing about that? Because I think framing it um, and then giving an example might be helpful in, in to illustrate it, which is, I think one of the big advantages for subnational entities like cities and, uh, and communities around a particular area have is the ability to take a systemic approach to resilience adaptation and climate change overall. My resiliency depends on your resiliency. I am interdependent with you over many spans of time. If I have that famous one house in, in Florida that wasn't knocked down during the hurricane, that's great that my house still exists, but it turns out I don't make all my own food, all my own healthcare, all my own energy supplies. Uh, all my own pharmaceuticals or anything else. My, my, my nested resilience or independent resilience is a feature of all of that. And to think about the way that we actually adapt to the future as not incremental. We don't want to just build the seawall one foot higher next year. Let's think about how we design cities as a community to deal with different types of inundation. How do we think about nature-based solutions? How do we think about the integration of business communities with government and how do we create resiliency within communities, whether it's recovery from storms in shopping centers or in schools through energy storage or other activities, which helps with the transition, but also um, provides us with the ability to support our population when we see these increasing events. So one example I wanted to give you about a hopeful future is uh, one of the companies that's out there that's interesting is a company called Source Global, and they make a solar powered hydro panel. So this is a technology that looks like a solar photoelectric panel, instead of generating electricity on a distributed basis from the sun, it generates pure drinking water, about five to nine liters of pure drinking water per panel under almost any atmospheric conditions that are out there. One of the major deployments that they just did was in Navajo Nation, which has less than 30% access to pipe drinking water and has the highest per capita COVID incidence in the United States. And this is not an isolated example of a community that has been impacted for historical reasons, environmentally. And then if you compound the water stress that the entire region that they live in is under with accelerating climate change, then you have a future that looks pretty challenging. But instead of saying, let's just ship them more bottled or tanked water, which increases carbon footprint and is not sustainable, you deploy panels on rooftops 
that can generate just like you generate electricity on a distributed basis without having to pull an entirely new electric electric grid. You can generate pure drinking water on site in a sustainable way. That's a totally different architecture for thinking about the future of a very increasingly scarce resource, which is drinking water. It's not simply saying we're going to make you know bottled water a little bit thinner this year, or we're going to reduce the carbon footprint of the way we truck or tank things. It's saying let's move to a different architecture and think about distributed architectures, resilient architectures, community-based architectures, and that level of planning and, and future thinking where we kind of try to think beyond the incremental, that I think is going to be required. And that's a huge opportunity as well for technology, for entrepreneurship, for capital, because what you end up with is, is a better outcome, right? People that have never had piped drinking water, locally accessible, certainly not 100% resilient or 100% sustainable, suddenly have it for the first time, just like we provided them with distributed solar uh, for, for electricity. So I think those are the kind of outcomes that can be done in a community way with the integration of that planning exercise in a forward looking way and a systemic way. That's the promise that we have and the opportunity, especially since we're about to make about two decades worth of investment decisions on infrastructure and the shape of our economy in about the next 18 months. So the decisions and design criteria that we actually install now will shape the future. And if we don't put the right DNA into it, uh, to the mayor's point, we will be rebuilding this in five or 10 years when a whole new series of shocks occurs. There are plenty of lead platinum rated buildings that were underneath um, the turnstiles flooded in Houston and other parts of coastal communities. It's not enough to have a low carbon strategy. It needs to be one that accounts for the future conditions we're gonna live under uh, and, and, and work that Co and others are doing IPCC which should shape that landscape. So the other extension thing I would ask you to say is, let's all agree on what we think a couple of models of the future are in the public and private sector. And that's simple agreement. We're using the same flood maps. We're using the same wind resistance uh, uh, assumptions. That can go a long way towards making sure there's alignment in the public and private sector and targets to shoot for for technology, targets to shoot for for investors as well. I'm such a fan of the distributed solution model. I just think that that's really important um, and and for disaster recovery as well. There's so much opportunity there. I, I want to relate that thought back to where we started, right? Because I think that the idea of building a different choice architecture for individuals, but also for local units of government is really important. When we're, when we're asking people to take on climate change, um, it, it's the individual actions are important, but they're totally insufficient, right? We need to be giving people a different choice architecture in which they can operate. And so it, your example is around drinking water. I would you know, bring up examples around transportation, right? We need to give people a different choice architecture by giving them low or no carbon transportation options. So it's not a, like, we're not just saying, well, don't drive. Right. We're saying, no, we are building out a whole suite of options that are low carbon transportation so that you can pick the one that works for you. Um, and you don't have to like individually create that option for yourself. And I think that thinking about where are those points, leverage points, right, where government can improve the choice architecture for folks. And th that's where we need to focus, because that's where you get then whole swaths of people able to make better choices and lower carbon choices. I think the flip side of that is capturing also the other benefits you get from the low carbon transition. I mean, there's, you know, the old saying that states are laboratories of democracy. What's been very interesting is I was on a Zoom call earlier today uh, with someone that was in California that whose power uh, in all the surrounding houses went out for whatever reason, but because he had, you know, deployed solar and had local so, like energy storage on site, he was resilient to that. He hadn't done it for that specific purpose. He was doing it because he wanted to support a low carbon trajectory. It's a, it's more effective in terms of the way he was getting different uh, power pricing, but capturing and measuring and, and recognizing it in a, in, a, in a way that you can actually compare the value of that distributed, resilient, sustainable architecture, not just by the hand wave, we need a resilient future, but metrics, like what you, you, know, you can't uh, manage what you can't measure, even agreeing that in the public and private sector and then creating experiments, right? So if brick gets deployed in a way where we say, let's try a whole bunch of different strategies at the local level, which I think is what the design is to build resiliency, to build a transition. 
and then work on scale to meet design criteria, I think you're likely to have an opportunity for investment to follow, but also the way that communities can come together uh, and, and plan this in a way that's going to look right for their community going forward and not a one size fits all. Well, it's, it's worth on this and then uh, and then definitely want to to hear from Gavin um, as we come into the into the finish line. But how do we make sure that these technologies, these advancements and opportunities are within reach of everyone and that we are actively factoring environmental justice and equity into what we're doing? Uh, first, Co. and then Gavin definitely want to hear. From yeah, that's exactly where I was going to jump in, because actually you have to have those people in the room a diversity of people in the room when the questions are starting to be formulated. I mean, I was up in Alaska um, prior to the release of IPCC's special report on oceans and cryosphere because I wanted to talk to people who would be reflected in this report and have in my heart kind of the actual faces of folks who are being impacted by the, the climate information that I was going to be a communicator for. And that was the refrain that I heard in community after community. Hey, you have to engage us early. We have to be a part of, of setting the questions. And, and I'll just say, because I have the perspective from the IPCC, that where we have over time engaged more developing country folks, a better gender balance of scientists engaged in these reports, they are stronger because you need diversity to sit around the table as you're looking to solve complex problems. You don't want people who think just like you also sitting around this table coming up with the narrow suite of solutions. So I just, you know, I think there's a really important diversity component of this conversation. Yeah, and I was just going to add uh, that the, the, the whole nation, the whole notion of, of co-benefits uh, for both adaptation and mitigation efforts uh, is, is really something that the scientists uh, can be helping with as well. I mean, the, the, the co-benefits in terms of, of air quality uh, and local pollution uh, for, um, uh, you know, new investment in, uh, in lower carbon technology um, uh, are a big, big part of how we can get um, immediate benefits from uh, investment investments today, even though the, the, the carbon impacts uh, will only really be felt on the climate, uh, you know, many, many years hence. Uh, but the, but the co-benefits happen very, very quickly. Uh, and, and when we build those in to those planning decisions, we actually build out, I think, a, a much broader coalition uh, to move forward on those kinds of actions. Appreciate that. Without question, the uh, the experience that, that is ongoing um, in, in coastal Louisiana from Ida, we see that it is the uh, low to moderate income um, households, it is small businesses that are struggling on the margins that are the least able to weather long standing uh, uh, interruption of, of power or potable water supplies. And it's important to note that that is not over, uh, that is an ongoing. Uh, crisis in um, in in uh, the Gulf Coast, and for for you know as Ida of course you know made its way uh, up into the Northeast, um, the the tragic losses in um, from urban and flash flooding in basements among folks who um, really uh, probably did not understand the risk that they were facing um, and may not have had uh, the information they needed when they needed it. Um, or to be able to get out of harm's way quickly um, is, is something that I know that we in the Congress are continuing to think about and, um, and work to address through climate uh, and federal policy with real intentionality. Um, and and I'd, I'd love the opportunity to, to go around the group on this uh, one more time, but it is that intentionality that I think may be our biggest challenge. If we continue to look at um, at grants or uh, uh, federal involvement in, in projects through a lens of benefits and costs in the ways that we currently measure it. We are um, missing the, the, the mandate to address inequities that are longstanding on the ground. From Congress's perspective, it means we may need to change the way that we are crafting legislation the methodologies that the Congressional Budget Office works on. I think for, uh, for the, the White House and the Office of Management and Budget, it can be looking at benefit cost analyses differently, looking at the M in OMB 
uh, differently and making sure that federal policies, decision making and investments are informed differently. Uh, just one example would be the way that we look at property value. If that is the only measure that we are using on the ground, uh, then, then we are, are missing some of the realities of the way that the climate crisis is already changing the value of property. Uh, so I, I'd love to go around the horn one more time. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Ko, we'll start with you uh, and, and we'll just go around and give everyone our last word. Um, well, I, I'm going to say that I think this conversation has yielded um, a lot of actionable and actionable information. I'm just super grateful to have spent um, spent this hour together, uh, and I, I leave with um, some intentions from this conversation about ways to engage better with the financial sector to think about ways to expand the extension activities we have undergoing underway in NOAA. Um, we have good boots on the ground, as I said, we've got weather offices in almost every community. Um, I don't think we fully thought through the ways that we can be, you know, really useful to this, um, to this equation here. Um, so I, I leave with some strong intentions of, of, and practical ways that we can work, uh, work together to, to solve this problem and to create stronger resilience. I think that may be a perfect note to end on. Um, I really want to thank each one of you so much for your, your thoughtful contributions to this dialogue. I think it's conversations like this that, uh, that span um, sectors, that span disciplines and, um, and experiences that, that can help move this conversation forward. Um, with that, I'm, I'm delighted to hand it back to our gracious host, uh, Bradley, but I, again, really want to thank FEMA. I want to thank MASA, the Resilient Nation Partnership Network, which is just, I think, one of the coolest things going. Um, and, uh, and just look forward to keeping this effort going and staying in touch with you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Samantha, Co, Jay, Gavin, and Mayor Rhodes Conway. Uh, we greatly appreciate your participation and amazing perspectives. I am so incredibly glad that we recorded this. Uh, there is a ton to unpack and so much insight on how we can take actionable steps forward. We definitely have our work cut out with us, uh, for us on the post-event resource. So thank you so very much. The next individual in the climate world really needs no introduction, but here we go. Uh, she's the first national climate advisor, the president's chief advisor on domestic climate policy, and leads the White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy focused on mobilizing a whole of government approach to tackling the climate crisis. Previously, she served as 13th administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, and then as president and CEO of the Natural Resources Defense Council. She has been someone who has clearly communicated the critical role partnerships will play as we work to address climate change. Thank you for joining us, Gina McCarthy. Brad, first of all, thank you for the gracious introduction. That was really neat. Um, but also I just wanna give a shout out to everyone in Resilient Nation Partnership Network. Uh, it, you know, uh, it, it is a cool thing. I mean, I'm so excited about it. Uh, who knew? Uh, that these, this kind of work was ongoing. And, and Brad, so thank you for helping to, to moderate today. But big thank and shout out to Administrator uh, Cresswell, who is uh, one of my heroes. She's amazing. Uh, and also to Senator Nelson, um, who I think is all of our heroes. You know, I can remember going into his office in the Senate and seeing that picture of the big earth um, floating in the sky, one of the first pictures ever uh, back at the earth so we could see the fragility of the world in which we live in. And much of the discussion today is how we can once again invest in that wonderful home of ours in a much more personal and sustainable way. So I'm really excited to be here today. And let me um, try to keep my, my remarks fairly short, um, but we are at an absolute critical moment in terms of our opportunity we have to actually build resilience into our world again. And we have to take advantage of this moment in time. You know, as I started in the White House 
uh, just in, in the January when President Biden came in. Yeah, I've been looking at all the daily reports of all the things going on in our national security world. And I've been reading about all of the challenges with wildfires that, believe it or not, this year has actually burned through more than six million acres of our precious resources. I've been reading about the droughts that we're experiencing in the West and the challenges in places like the Klamath River Basin, where you have farmers looking for the water at the same time as our natural resource folks are looking to preserve water and the challenges that that brings. And I'm looking at all of the hurricanes and the wild and the, and the extreme weather events that are happening. And I'll tell you, you can't help but say, okay, resilience is it. <laughs> we have to start acting together now. And I know I traveled with Administrator Criswell uh, when, when she went to New York and New Jersey uh, with President Biden. And, I, you know, you have to see this firsthand to really understand the extent of the challenges here. We actually had a hurricane that, le that landed in Louisiana, and it still packed enough power to wreak havoc in New Jersey and New York with families that no longer had a home to go to, with communities that were devastated, lives lost. And so when you look at all this, you have to realize that, man, climate change is here. It's time for us to embrace this challenge, and it's time for us to move forward together. And we can only do that if we build partnerships together, that needs to be a partnership at the federal level with every other level of government. And we have to make this climate crisis both personal and an opportunity for us to make progress in the world. You know, so this has to happen at a scale that is absolutely extraordinary. And we have to work together to make that happen. You know, the, it's, it's very small comfort to know that with all these droughts and hurricanes and extreme wildfires and other things, you know, we have very few climate deniers to have to tend to. <laughs> that small comfort though, we have the challenges that we have to face together. And I know that, that, it, that FEMA works in a way that brings so many of our federal resources together at a time when they are so necessary. If you looked at what happened to the, to the in the wake of Hurricane Ida, you saw a mobilization of federal agencies across the the country. You saw that you saw not just a standard FEMA and all the work we needed to do to protect people right away, but you saw the Department of Health and Human Services setting up medical stations and evacuation sites. You saw the Coast Guard the Department of Defense doing search and rescue. You even had the Small Business Administration and the, De and the Department of Housing and Urban Development and others providing immediate financial relief to those families and businesses. And you also saw agencies working in partnership with electricity companies and wireless carriers to get people connected and get the heat on or the, or the air conditioning on as soon as possible. That is the kind of effort that we need to make for resilience writ large. We can't just think about the emergencies. We have to work together to prepare for those emergencies and use every tool in our toolbox to make sure that we are moving in a way that is going to be building communities back better in a way that's more resilient to the changing climate that's already happening. And we simply cannot reverse it. And it's through those partnerships that the federal government, I think, has learned clearly through the work that we've been doing that, that this needs to be a whole of government effort. It's not just about what FEMA does. It's not just about what we're able to bring to the table with the Department of Defense. This is about building these types of resilience partnerships so that we can be stronger as a nation. And President Biden put me in this position because he wanted a whole of government approach. 
I am sitting in the White House, no longer just at EPA doing that fun work. I'm now doing work across the federal agencies to make sure that we're working together with all of our resources to make this work possible. We're looking at our, our first national climate task force. Every single agency is involved because climate impacts every facet of our life. Climate impacts all of the work that the federal government is doing and needs to do. And it demands that we work in concert, hand in hand with our states and local communities, because we know that this is necessary. This is how we now have to operate. And I'll give you a good example. We just launched a, a whole collaboration and partnership um, across the federal government to take a look at extreme heat, which is also something that's significantly challenging our, our communities and our federal resources. We are looking at making sure that our Department of Labor starts protecting our laborers and our outdoor workers by establishing some standards so that they can be assured they can protect themselves in high heat. We're looking at and pull together a heat illness prevention work group so we can work across the country, making sure that our workers are protected. We have the Department of Health and Human Services that's being creative now with LIHEAP funds, so we can make sure that we can buy air conditioners for our senior citizens, because they call heat stress the silent killer, because people die in their homes and nobody recognizes that it was a direct impact from climate change. We're looking at EPA, who's working with schools across the country to set up cooling stations. This is what I mean by a whole of government approach. This is what we have to do. You know, when President Biden uh, brought together all of our agencies, he said, you know, climate change isn't a planetary problem. It's a people problem. We have to all work together and address it. That's why he's moving forward with his Build Back Better agenda, because this is about investing in our future. This is investing in our communities. This is about listening to the science, not denying the science. This is about expanding the kinds of information services that we can provide to our communities, share information, share best practices, work together, because in the end, this is about how we treat one another and how our country can grow great jobs and win the 21st century. This is not about sacrifice. This is about investments in our country once again and our future, recognizing that our kids deserve better than what they're given now. We have to work together and turn this around. So we are going to embrace this climate challenge, recognize that climate, the climate has changed, and we are going to work together in partnership at every level of government and with the private sector and the public sector and philanthropy so that we can get this job done in a way that shows the rest of the world that we care about our future, we care about our families. The U.S. is going to lead in this domestic effort to address climate change. And we are going to march into Glasgow for the next conference of the parties with our head held high. And we are going to lead the world to address this challenge because after all, we have no choice. And we can choose the path of least resistance, which is to invest in ourselves and keep our families and our children healthy and safe and give them the kind of bright future that they deserve. This is what this partnership is all about. We're just trying to put it on steroids so every community can feel like they're part of this opportunity moving forward. The future needs to be hopeful and bright and if we work together, we can make it just that. Thanks, Brad. Brad, we can't hear you You're on, on mute. It's inevitable. Welcome to the virtual world. Um, if I'm smiling really, really big right now and probably blushing, it's because I was on mute. But also, it's because it's awesome to hear from people like Sam Medlock and you, Gina McCarthy, that the work we are doing with the Resilient Nation Partnership Network is totally cool. Uh, that was an incredible call to action and a perfect way to close out day one of this partnership forum. 
Many thanks to all our speakers for an impactful first day of the Alliances for Climate Action Forum series. We appreciate your willingness to participate in this event and hope to build on these conversations as we move forward. Next week, our focus will be on climate migration and managed retreat. We will combine panel discussion with the stories of individuals who are actively working to address this key climate issue with opening remarks from Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker. If you are not part of the Resilient Nation Partnership Network and wish to join and be added to our distribution list, please just send a note to fema-resilientnation at fema.dhs.gov, we dropped it in the chat, or you can visit our website at fema.gov backslash RNPN. Thank you all for joining us today and we look forward to convening again next week.